Hi, my name is Mike Thomas, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you all Dr. James P. Lewis, the president of the Lewis Institute. I've known James since uh, Jim, as I prefer to call him, since about 1980. And I want to just give some of his qualifications and achievements and then say a few personal things about him. In the first place, he is a qualified engineer. He was an engineer, an engineering manager, a project manager for ITT and Aerotron. Uh, he is an outstanding workshop leader. He has trained uh, at least 20,000 people, maybe 13, 20,013 since yesterday. He is, has written seven books, uh, internationally known and distributed, and if you count the revisions of those books, he has written ten books. Uh, let me just say a couple of things about Jim uh, personally, is that even though I know him primarily as a friend and as a colleague and instructor and project manager, one thing about Jim is for sure is that he is not, he's not given to giving BS to people. He speaks from his heart, he speaks the truth, he does not speak beyond his knowledge or beyond his experience. And so he is very eager to, in his presentations, to have interaction with participants. And his style of presentation is one that he elicits questions and comments from people. And so it's my privilege and uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. James P. Lewis. OK, thank you, Mike. And uh, good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to this presentation. We're going to talk today about achieving excellence in project management. And uh, since I've been in this business for nearly 20 years, I've thought an awful lot about what it takes for an organization to become really excellent in project management. And being primarily involved in training and consulting, I, I very candidly have been uh, disappointed in some of the results that we've had with the training programs that we've presented. I have some clients that I've presented uh, training to as many as uh, 300 people and uh, find that maybe 10 percent of them actually use what they've learned. And so the question for me has been, how do you improve on that ratio? How do you get people to really do what they've learned to do? And how do you make project management a core competency in an organization? So those are the kinds of things we're going to explore. And in particular, since this video is addressed to senior managers and those to whom project managers report, uh, we're also going to talk about what you folks need to do to actually support and drive the effort so that it actually becomes uh, viable in your organization. If you'll move to the slide that's titled A Core Competence, I'd like to just uh, address that for a minute. Tom Peters wrote a book called Liberation Management a number of years ago in which he was saying that already more than 50 percent of what gets done in organizations is actually done in a, pr a project format. And I suspect that if you were to take a look at organizations today, you'd find that that ratio has increased, that in some companies, maybe as much as 90 percent of what gets done is actually project format. I've been doing some work with Boeing commercial airplanes, and Alan Malala, who's the president of Boeing, uh, Boeing Commercial, has said to me that they make very little distinction between project management and general management because many of the principles are the same. So they clearly see project management as something that is uh, central to their success in, or in business and to their survival. I'd like to begin by establishing a few definitions and terms because what I've found over the years is that the terms project and project management are bounced around very loosely and that they mean different things to different people and there's no common agreement about what they mean. So the first thing I do uh, is to define what you mean by a project. A project is a job that's done one time and is multitask in nature. It's not a repetitive sort of thing. It has a clear starting point, a clear ending point, a well-defined scope of work. Usually there's a budget and usually there's a temporary team that does the work and then moves on to something else. Now I also like to say to people if you ever see a project that conforms to that definition send me an email so I can write a case study about it <laughs> because uh, unfortunately they don't have clear starting points and we know they don't have clear ending points. They, they're like that uh, Ever Ready Bunny commercial where the bunny just keeps on going and going and going, you know, and project managers begin to think they're going to make a career out of that one job, which indeed some, sometimes they do. 
But this is the textbook definition, and it's the one that we would actually like to adhere to as much as possible, because if we could adhere to this definition, our projects would actually be more successful. Now, the definition of project management. Project management is the planning, scheduling, and controlling of all the activities on a project that are needed to be done to meet project objectives. Note that it is not just scheduling, which is a fairly common misconception. A lot of people think of project management as primarily, well, we'll put together a critical path schedule and a Gantt chart with some scheduling software, and they think that's it, which unfortunately it's not. The other thing I'd like to make clear is I have a lot of folks come to my training programs who are doing one-person projects. Now, the thing about that is we call those people project managers. When you're doing a project that involves nobody but yourself, that's not really project management, that's self-management. And the only tools you actually need to do that are good time management tools. You, you don't need a critical path schedule because unless you're ambidextrous, you don't have parallel paths or unless you have contractors working, which then changes it. It's no longer a one-person project, actually. So we should be very clear that people are project managers only when several people are involved in the job. Now, one of the first questions that I get asked when I have a multidisciplinary group in a seminar is, can you teach an approach to project management that's going to work for any kind of project, no matter what it is? Well, I have clients who are involved in biotech, heavy equipment, Caterpillar, for example, uh, electrical engineering, product development, food sciences, you name it. Brain surgery can be thought of as a project. And while I haven't had any brain surgeons, I did have a retinal surgeon in the class in L.A. one time, and he was there because he sees surgery as a project and wanted to learn a little bit more about it. So here's the way I like to think about project management. Project management is a disciplined thought process. You can apply that thought process to any kind of project, doesn't matter what it is. And the way I like to define the thought process is to use the flow chart that you can see on this, on this particular slide. Now, this is a very, obviously, very reduced slide that's useless in, in the form it's in there, but you have a copy of the flow chart that's separate here. And uh, I give everybody in my classes this. This defines the process. And to the degree that people follow this process, they're going to increase their probability of success in a project. To the degree that they try to wing it, they're going to increase their probability of failure. This process has been applied to, as I said earlier, all kinds of different projects, including advertising, development, marketing programs, and so on, and I happen to know it works. I also can tell you that there are common points in this process where projects tend to fail. Step number two, which is the definition stage, and step uh, 14, or 16, I'm sorry, uh, 16 down at the bottom, are common points of failure. In other words, at the very beginning and at the very end. And we'll talk a little more about that as we go along. As you can see from the uh, overall flow chart, there are essentially five phases in my model. The first phase is the definition phase. And this is where I say projects tend to fail because we don't spend enough time at that step. The next step is development of project strategy. And a lot of people try to totally bypass this stage. They just want to get on and start doing the work. The next stage is the implementation planning stage, where once you understand what the strategy is going to be, you now have to decide how to go about it. As a simple example of, of the strategy phase, in World War II, when Avondale Shipyards was trying to increase the rate at which they built ships, they decided that instead of building the boat right side up with the keel down the way it had always been done, they'd turn it upside down, build it with the keel up because it made it much easier to weld on the outside and up inside the keel area. That's a very unusual strategy and interestingly it's one that's still being used today, uh, 40 or 50 years later. But it's an important strategy because they could build ships of higher quality and faster than any of the competitors in the business. Matter of fact, it's a really fascinating thing to know that they were building Liberty ships at the rate of one every 10 to 12 days. They'd put them to sea with the painters on board and paint them as they went across. So uh, they worked out a lot of really interesting strategies back then. Now, what's the difference between strategy and implementation planning? 
Well, once you've decided you're going to build boats upside down, you then have to work out how you're going to do it. For example, how are you going to turn it over once you get it welded together? So that's part of the implementation planning stage. The next phase in this whole process is you've got your plan, now you've got to do it. And we call this the execution and control stage. And on the overall flow chart, you will notice that there are loops down there because as you monitor progress, you may find that you're not where you belong and you have to go into uh, corrective action steps and things of that nature. And we're not going to go into detail about that here because the purpose of this briefing is not to teach project management in detail, but to talk more about how to make it work. Finally, the last phase in the whole process I call learning and closeout. Now again, this is a phase in projects where we tend to fail because by the time we get down to this step, most people are sort of ready to get on with something else. So what tends to happen is we don't do any lessons learned reviews. And of course what that means is that we repeat the same mistakes on the next project that we made on the previous one. So those are the kinds of things that uh, we encounter. Now let's do talk a little bit about uh, something very important to project managers because this is a constant cause of problems for managers and project managers alike. Every project has four constraints or objectives. When I first started teaching project management, it was common for people to talk about three constraints. In fact, you still hear this referred to an awful lot, the triple constraints on projects. And in the colloquial language that most of us use, we say good, fast, and cheap. And the old saying is, good, fast, and cheap, pick two. Well, it occurred to me that we were missing something, namely scope. Scope is how big the project is, and it turns out that scope itself is one of the major causes of projects getting in trouble because the scope changes. And unfortunately, what happens is the scope creeps upward, and it works this way. People come to you and they say, can you do this? And you say, yes. Oh, well, we've got to have that. Well, that's a change in scope. And in many cases, it occurred because they forgot something from the beginning. They didn't do a good enough job at the definition phase, so this is an afterthought or an oops experience, okay? You, you have to control these scope changes or they kill a project. And a project manager has a responsibility to say, yes, we can do it, but here's the impact on the project. Do you still want us to do it? Make a decision. So I have to say, this is what it's going to take to make that change, and if you want it, fine. If you don't, then let's forget it. Well, you notice that there's an equation that ties these variables together. I like to write it the way you'll see it on the page there on the slide. Cost is a function of performance, time, and scope. Now, ideally, you could write that as an algebraic expression. Cost is 2P plus 3T plus 4S or something of that nature. Realistically, you don't ever know exactly what that mathematical relationship is. You're, you're estimating everything. But we do know it does exist. And so a graphical way of showing it is to use a triangle. And scope is essentially the area or size of the triangle, and P, C, and T are the, are the sides. And we know from geometry that if we have the values of three sides, we can calculate the area. Or if we have the two sides in the area, we can calculate the third side. So again, what that says is you can't assign values to all four of those at the same time. It's like good, fast, cheap, pick two. Well, in this case, good, fast, cheap, and scope, pick three. Now, this is an, an especially important message to senior managers and project sponsors because there's a temptation in many cases to try to assign values to all four of those. And I can tell you, if they fit together, it's an accident, it's not by design. So what will often happen is the sponsor will dictate the, the variables on the right-hand side, performance, time, and scope. Project manager goes away and figures out what it's going to cost to meet those targets. And I always joke that they should have uh, CPR people standing by when they tell the sponsor what the cost <laughs> is because they're bound to have a heart attack and they're going to need to be resuscitated. So be sure you have somebody standing by to do that because they will almost always say, how can it cost so much? Because they had in their back of their mind some figure. And they may follow that up with, we can't afford it. Well, my response as a project manager then has to be, well, you tell me what you can afford, and I'll tell you what I can give you for it. It's a balanced equation, so something has to give on the right-hand side. Okay?
Does that all make sense to everybody? Now, as I've just said, the message here is that you can't dictate all four of these variables, and if you insist on doing so, you can almost guarantee that the project is set up to fail from the very beginning. Now, let's talk a little bit about project failures. I know this is not a very popular thing to talk about, but we need to, to address this because if we can understand the cause of failures, hopefully we can prevent them. The Standish Group has been doing surveys of software development projects for a number of years, and the first one that I have data for occurred back around 1994. They found that in the United States alone, we spent something like $250 billion on software development projects with these results. 17% of those projects met the original performance cost time and scope targets. 50% of them had to have those targets changed, which means they're late, they're overspent, they have reduced functionality, they don't do everything they were supposed to, which would be scope. And the scary part is that 33% of those projects were actually canceled because they got into so much trouble that they were not salvageable. Well, what that says is, $80 billion was trashed just because we had to cancel those projects. The really compelling thing is to realize that 83% of all the software projects done got in trouble. That's really bad. That's really frightening. Well, interestingly, in the years since 1994, the statistics don't seem to have changed much, even though we've trained thousands of people to be project managers. And Microsoft has sold a million copies of Microsoft Project, so the tools exist and the training exists, and yet the problem still persists. In fact, an ad in a software development magazine a week or so ago said that they estimate that we're spending or wasting about $120 billion a year in, in the U.S. on software projects. So those figures are still pretty high. The other thing that's interesting is that the Standish Group always asks, what are the correlates of success and failure in these projects? And again, the results tend to be fairly persistent. The correlates of success are good planning and good understanding of your client, which means that if you plan well and you understand your client's requirements well, you tend to be successful and conversely. And this is the very thing that we tend not to do well. And remember I told you that's up at step two in my flow chart where we don't define it well and we don't plan it well. If you think of this in terms of quality, what we find is that most organizations are running at about a three sigma quality level. This is a term used by the uh, statisticians to indicate where on a normal distribution errors fall. And it translates into very simple terms. If we perform a million operations in an organization, 66,400 of them will be done wrong. 66,400. And this figure is true of projects as well as manufacturing operations. The problem is we don't tend to use these same measures in projects because it isn't as easy to establish numerical measures in projects so that we can track it. But we know that the, the same kind of finding is true. The cost of poor quality at this, sig at this three sigma level is about 30 cents of every sales dollar. In terms of project work, what it amounts to is that about 30 cents of every dollar spent on a project will be waste, and most of it is in the form of rework, people having to redo what's been done. Tom Peters likes to talk about things like this being good news, bad news stories, and I agree with him. This is one of the world's best good news, bad news stories. The bad news is that when you have a 30% rework figure, it means that a third of your people, one of every three people working on the project is spending full time to redo what the other two people did wrong to begin with. That's the bad news. The good news is that if you can cut that out, you've gained a huge amount of improvement very quickly. As a matter of fact, I suggest to senior managers that the quickest way to show that you're getting better at project management is to track the rework. And you'll see that on the next slide. The blue curve represents process improvement. Process improvement usually follows an S-shaped curve, as you can see here, where in the early stages, it's hard to get any gains. And then the curve accelerates, and then as you get better and better and better, you, re you reach the point of diminishing returns, and the curve turns shallow again. Rework should follow the inverse curve, and that's shown by the red dotted curve that goes down. 
So over a period of time, you should see your rework costs decline because you're getting better at project management. Now, if you can get down to the bottom of that rework curve, you are down close to what would be called a six sigma quality level, which means that your errors are six standard deviations down below the mean. And that means that of a million chances to make a mistake, you'll only do it 3.4 times as opposed to 66,400. So that's a huge improvement. And it drops the cost of poor quality to about three cents of every dollar, which again is a 10 to one improvement. Cost of quality can be attributed to three factors. When I worked at ITT, uh, Phil Crosby was vice president of quality at ITT. And ITT was very numbers driven. So one of Phil's claims to fame was to measure the cost of quality. And he put it in three categories, prevention, appraisal, and failure. Prevention is anything you do to avoid errors. Appraisal is inspecting to see if you can find them. And failure is what happens if you miss them. The 80-20 rule says that we tend to spend 80% of our money on failure and appraisal and only 20% on prevention. If we increase the amount of money spent on prevention, what we'll find is that the cost of appraisal and failure actually decline. And as you can see from the two bar graphs, uh, the two bars in the bar graph here, the difference between the original bar and the second bar is the actual savings that you accumulate. So you can get big gains in savings by doing a better job on prevention. Well, what does that mean for projects? Project prevention activities include project prioritization. What we find in organizations is that people are working on entirely too many projects for the available resources. And when project managers are trying to juggle three or four projects at the same time and they say to senior managers, uh, give me a priority, they're often told it all has to be done. Well, when all of it has to be done, the word priority just lost its meaning. And so that's a clear cause of, of problems in many organizations. Another project prevention activity is to get very clear about the mission and the vision for that project. Again, this is step two in the flow chart where we're trying to define, pin down exactly what it is we're trying to do. I had a young lady tell me in a class uh, just this week that her people had come to her with uh, project plans and she kicked back both of them because when she asked them to tell her concisely what it was they were really trying to accomplish, they couldn't do it. And she said, then I'm not going to approve it. You don't know what you're trying to do yet. At the PMI chapter meeting in Raleigh, North Carolina last night, a fellow came up to me, he said, I'm fairly new to software. I've been in hardware all my life. And he said, my people are driving me up the wall. He said, they're off coding, and they don't know what they're coding. You know, they haven't taken time to define it. So then we start reviewing status, and, well, the status of what they're doing is okay, but it's the wrong thing. Again, it's that failure to define the thing correctly at the very beginning. Good planning. How are you going to get where you want to go? This is a prevention activity. And the other one that's a, it's, it's actually a two-fold thing is to do lessons learned reviews and act on what you learn. Unfortunately, in many organizations, even when they do lessons learned reviews, they don't act on them. So they make the same mistakes again. And what's really sad is that if they did something really well, they don't necessarily capture that and do it over again. So they don't learn and, and grow from what they learn. Appraisal activities include a few things like data-based project reviews, status reviews, where are we in the project. If you don't have a data-based status review, you really don't know where you are. And I've sat through some fairly appalling reviews where people would say, okay, how's this project? And someone would say, fine. Okay, and we move on. There's no data there to support fine, so we don't know whether it's fine or not. Design reviews. Now, these don't apply to everybody. Obviously, people that are designing software or hardware should be doing design reviews. But those are a normal part of uh, any project. And the one that we're talking about that people tend not to do is lessons learned reviews. Just to put this in perspective for you, at a conference on project management a couple of years ago, the keynote speaker asked an audience of 400 people, how many of you do regular lessons learned reviews to end your projects? And I think 11 or 12 hands went up. 
He then asked a question that I consider even more compelling than that. He said, okay, of you folks that put your hands up, how many of you have a mandate from your organization that says before you can do your next project, you have to show us how you will avoid the mistakes you made on your last project? Two hands went up. In other words, even of the very few people who were doing lessons learned reviews, again, they're not acting on them. And this is pretty common. So every time I teach a class, I say to people, how many of you do lessons learned reviews? And it's still pretty dismal. It's getting a little bit better, but it's still dismal.